Uh, to my immediate left, Joan O'Sara, columnist for the New York Times and uh, for Fortune magazine. To his left, Rajiv Chandrasekharan, who covered the trial for the Washington Post and went on to many other positions in the Post, uh, spent a lot of time in Iraq, uh, wrote a fabulous, uh, fairly amazing book about uh, Iraq and the green zone there, and is now national editor uh, at the Washington Post. To his left, uh, Mark Murray, who, as I said, was Microsoft's chief uh, spokesperson during the trial and is now uh, sort of chief of all, all things public relations and global relations for Microsoft. And finally, John Wilkie, uh, one of the most dogged and persistent reporters during the trial and still, uh, and doing great work at the Wall Street Journal. Gentlemen. Um, hi, I'm Joe Nocera, and uh, we, we do understand that when, they have a, when you have a panel of journalists after economists, professors, lawyers, we're the entertainment. <laughs> we get it. <laughs> So um, we will try to make our remarks um, moderately brief, have a little more Q&A time, and um, just uh, all of us are going to make a few observations. We all have different, um, ex I mean, Rajiv uh, really hasn't covered the trial or uh, hasn't covered business since that um, uh, trial. I cover business all the time, pretty much the same way I did. Uh, John Wilkie still um, writes about antitrust and still writes about Justice Department issues and still breaks news. And uh, Ma Mark Murray still uh, says, uh, picks up thing. the phone and says it's another great day for Microsoft. No, <laughs> <laughs> no he doesn't. He really doesn't. He took my um, talking point. <laughs> right. So when, when, um, when Brad Smith was talking this morning, uh, I just want to make three or four observations. When Brad Smith was uh, talking this morning, I thought of another person that I wrote about a couple of years ago named Steve Parrish, um, who worked for Altria, the, the, the parent company of Philip Morris. And um, what, what brought it to mind was the idea that um, at that point in Microsoft's life, it was an incredibly insular place where people only talked to each other, and they viewed everybody on the outside as either idiots or enemies. And what happens when you have, and so when, you, when a company gets traumatized the way the tobacco industry was 10 years ago uh, when it went through its travails in the mid-90s, and the way Microsoft was traumatized in the, in, the, in the Microsoft trial, it forces companies to stop just talking to each other and to start, it forces them, they have no choice, they have to sit down and listen to other people. And they can't just talk at them. And one of the things I felt all during the Microsoft trial is that they would talk at them, at us, the press, but they would only really listen to each other. And that has changed. That is one thing that I think has profoundly changed at Microsoft, is that um, Brad said that the trial, he said at the cocktail party yesterday, that the trial taught him, taught Microsoft how to deal with the press. But I actually think it taught Microsoft how to deal with society and taught it to realize that just because you have a bunch of really smart engineers and a really bunch of really smart business people, that doesn't mean you're smart about, you're right about every aspect of society. And it doesn't mean you have to maybe do things that give society more comfort. So that's point number one. Um, point number two, um, I think a lot now about uh, what I really saw when I was there. And I actually think I've learned a lot today about that. Um, uh, you know, Journalists need characters, and David was a great character. And the titan called Microsoft was another great character. And it really, the, the press, it was so easy for the press to characterize it as a fight between good and evil or a fight between a guy who really knew how to kill these guys and um, uh, another team that all they knew how to do was say, you know, hit me again, hit me again. That's what, and, and, and you'd have all these moments in the trial where David just, the, the, the person who asked about what are your most memorable moments, well, I think for us in the press, the, the most memorable moment was when Ed had discovered that the video of the Alchin screens had been, you know, basically done by the marketing department, and they weren't what they purported to be. And um, it was a day, it was as close to a Perry Mason moment as you're going to have in an antitrust trial. I mean, it's just like... How can this be happening? Um, and you, we wrote about it as, as, a, as drama. Um, and I have thought a lot afterwards about, you know, what, what was real and what was not real and, and, and what was show and what was, you know, 
just pure theatrics. And I think a lot of what David said today spoke, spoke to that about the issues of, um, uh, of, 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 of how it's, it also becomes a morality play and how that factors in. Um, my third um, comment of four, I will say, is that why in the world did the judge ever talk to the press? I, I will never understand this till I, I, I just, it's inexplicable. I never, I'd never covered a trial like this before. I hope John talks about this a little bit because I, I just was stunned to discover afterwards that three sets of reporters were having back channel conversations with Judge Jackson while this was going on. And then of course it all came out and, and it certainly wasn't the, hardly the only or the most important reason the Court of Appeals removed him and slapped him around a little, but it's certainly, certainly one reason. Um, finally, see I told you we're going fast here. Um, I, as somebody who's written a lot about internet and computing over the last decade, I am struck by how much of Microsoft's arguments, which we in the press did not take seriously at the time, have turned out to be true. Um, one of the things they used to say was, you don't know where innovation is going to come from. And we would laugh. And they would say, there's this company called Red Hat that has this thing called Linux. It's going to be a threat. It's going to be a threat. And we would say, ah, come on, get real. And, and, and you know, Google, you know, this is the 10th anniversary of Google. Google was founded when the Microsoft trial was going on. And who knew that that was going to be a great source of innovation and was going to diminish the importance and power uh, of operating systems. We, you know, one, part of the problem of, uh, part of the problem of life, really, is that it's, it, it, whatever cocoon you happen to be in, whatever era you happen to be in, whatever you have to see in front of you, whatever you see in front of you tends to be what you think will always be. And it's not. And, you know, I do, uh, uh, I do think the trial changed the way Microsoft operates dramatically, and I think the trial also allowed, I mean, a lot of competition, and I will end with this anecdote, which I think speaks to this a little bit. A couple of years ago, Bill Gates came to the New York Times, to the editorial bureau, and the publisher, Arthur Schulzberger, was there, and all the top editors were there, and, and I was, this is one of the few times they've ever let me in there, and um, <laughs> you can see why they don't. And, uh, <laughs> And somebody said to Gates, and he was, it was very interesting. I mean, he was uh, talking mostly about his foundation, but then he talked a little bit about business. And when he talked about business, boy, you could see he was just, he was comfortable with it in a way he wasn't in talking about his foundation. So see, there were laughter and jokes, and somebody said, so are you going to do to Google what you did to Netscape? And he said, nah, we'll find another way. <laughs> Rajiv? No, it's Wilkie. John, John, you're next. Okay, okay. Uh, I, f I first started uh, becoming aware of, of Microsoft and its power covering Lotus and Borland and some other companies that aren't around anymore uh, in Boston. And I moved to Washington and started to uh, become aware of this, this thing called the, uh, the browser which was being called the on-ramp or gateway to the internet. And I met as the uh, preparations for, for the case started to wind up uh, Mark Andreessen, who um, is, invented it or... Um, and he, That's what he would say. <laughs> and he, he said that Microsoft had tried to shut him down had tried to, had threatened them and told him that he could have part of the market, uh, but that they'd take the rest. That was his claim. He said, I half expected to find a bloody computer monitor in my bed, um, and thus began the morality play. Uh, somewhere along there, David Boys got hired as special counsel, and um, uh, the trial began and I think um, took on an extraordinary life of its own. Um, Microsoft made, uh, scored again and again, um, points that were being ignored. Um, David and the government team uh, kept coming around, coming back to credibility 
And at the end of the day, when we all stood out on the courthouse steps, um, it seemed as if uh, the government won the day uh, uh, over and over again. Um, we ended up with uh, a victory for, for the United States, um, upheld by a, a unanimous appeals court, a very conservative unanimous appeals court. Um, a new administration came in, um, and I had a an experience um, that I will, uh, which that I'll never forget. After that new administration came in, um, I heard that uh, uh, Steve Ballmer was visiting uh, uh, Dick Cheney, uh, and on, uh, in August of 2001. Um, this was a secret meeting. It wasn't on his uh, schedule. It wasn't on the vice president's schedule. It wasn't announced by Microsoft. Um, uh, I, uh, a friend told me to be there uh, at an appointed moment, and sure enough, there was Steve Ballmer walking out of the West Wing of the White House after having secretly met with, uh, with Dick Cheney. Um, at the time, we didn't know how powerful uh, Cheney would become or was. Uh, and I have always wondered uh, what happened in that meeting. Um, I started working really hard on trying to figure out what this new administration would do uh, uh, with this case. Um, and it took me a few weeks, but we, I had a, a story um, a few weeks later that, that said that Microsoft had entered uh, secret settlement talks. Uh, with the government, and the story was published on the morning of September 11th, um, and no one cared. Um, Judge Kolar Catelli very strangely um, said that it was some sort of patriotic urgency um, to settle the case now that now that uh, the terrorists had attacked us somehow, and so uh, the settlement emerged. Um, uh, at the time, it, it seemed to a lot of people uh, commenting on the case and following it uh, to be a slap on the wrist. Um, I don't know what kind of effect, uh, I, I'm not really, I'm not sure I can say what kind of effect it's had, uh, but the marketplace certainly had its own effect um, because just a few days ago, I saw Microsoft call search the gateway to the internet uh, and we hired and the United States hired Sandy Litvak as special prosecutor in in the Google uh, case um, uh, in the Google matter, matter which may or may not be a case so there's a weird symmetry there over these past 10 years um, and I've always wondered what happened on that August day <laughs> Uh, we can come back in, in discussion about uh, Sporkin and Jackson, and uh, Joe, I'd like to ask, a answer your question when we, uh, okay. when we open up. Well, the uh, talk about unintended consequences, I never thought that all those months spent covering the Microsoft case would lead me to flee the country for multiple war zones, but so be it. <laughs> This thing did all different things to different people. Um, but <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a great honor to be here with, with both Joe and John. Um, and, and I've got to say, when, when you know, the, the, the history of this continues to be written, it's really their work in, in different ways that I think we will all continue to draw upon when it comes to looking at press accounts from this. John, just because of of, of you know the, the scoops that that he had in the the lead up to the case being filed during the case and uh, as recently as this past week um, on a unrelated matter but you know just as the, sort of the preeminent uh, antitrust reporter uh, in this country um, and in what what Joe did um, that was such a stroke of genius was was to write about this 
as a diarist, as a, as, as a sort of a sketcher, and to tell a story because this, you know, this was fundamentally, um, you know, a, a, a hell of a tale unfolding in a federal courtroom in Washington, D.C. With, um, uh, with, 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 with incredibly, um, uh, you know, compelling characters on both sides uh, and an awful lot at stake. And, um, you know, there was the drumbeat of daily coverage uh, that, you know, focused on, uh, you know, as 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 David uh, um, mentioned earlier, you know, we often did focus on sort of the, the gotcha moment of the day. Um, but uh, when you go back and you read uh, Joe's um, uh, sort of uh, sketches or diary uh, uh, pieces for for Fortune over the course of this, it it is in some ways um, ev and it gets better with the with the passage of time. Um, you know, I think, I think, no, no, uh, one of the, 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 the uh, um, you know, best ways to sort of come, come back at, uh, at this material. And, you know, it's not that many cases, uh, or put, let, let's, let's even expand beyond um, cases of law, but, but that many sort of stories we in the press corps get to cover where um, you might find yourself on a panel 10 years later with somebody, you know, you were sparring with over the phone day in, day out, um, and, and, and to just sort of see people on both sides of the case having come together, I think, you know, really speaks to um, something you know, very unique about this, and in our sort of very politically charged environment, not just in, in the world of Washington politics, but in so many things in this country today, to uh, to see that, you know, people on both sides of, of this case can sort of come together 10 years later, but even during the trial, there was this sort of remarkable spirit of, of, of bonhomie that existed, you know, there was, it was, um, in some ways, you know, reminded me, and I, I don't mean to make make too much light of this, of of the old uh, Warner Brothers cartoon where you know the sheep and the wolf sort of clock in and they spend all day chasing each other, and then the, the whistle blows and they clock out, <laughs> and um, you know, a, 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 some of you may may know, but on Thursday nights. Um, you know, we in the press corps, because we have a particular affinity for alcohol, would would generally gather at a. Um, at a bar or a restaurant, uh, it started out initially at the Capitol Grill, and then when we, you know, started to get called on our expense accounts, it sort of, you know, degenerated from there. Went to some sort of, you know, low-grade steakhouse in D.C. Um, but uh, we were we were uh, invariably joined by by folks on both sides. David would sometimes come, as well as other officials uh, on the government side. Mark and and his colleague Vivek Varma would be there, and um, and. Uh, it was. It was just. You don't see that uh, these days in Washington, and even in that, even ten years ago, it was remarkably rare. Um, and I think it was just, you know, for for for, for me, and I think for, for 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 other colleagues in the press, uh, what part of what made this unique? Um, a couple of other points. You know, when I think back to the start of this, um, it's 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 remarkable just how. Um, you know, I think uninformed most of us in the press corps were. Um, you know, you had some reporters who were real specialists in, in the law and had covered antitrust issues. You had many other reporters who would come with some sort of technology background. Um, and you had others who were just sort of general assignment court reporters. Uh, and everybody was sort of trying to bone up in their own way. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it, 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 it still speaks to the fact that, that Many of us in in the news business are are fundamentally generalists, and um, there was there was an awful lot that was sort of transpiring on any given day that that was sort of rightly going over our heads, and and that sort of segues into you know, the the way the government you know put on its case, and and not to be sort of duplicative of of what David was saying earlier, and I clear I, I you know I, I obviously won't be as as articulate as he was, but the way that you know the government you know framed its case um, gave us uh, in many ways a very compelling narrative, and then those those sorts of Perry Mason moments made for made for great stories. Um, made for uh, you know, got this got 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 a got an antitrust trial on TV every now and again. I mean, go figure. Um, and 
and, and that approach to, to, to not just sort of trying to, 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 play, to, to sort of uh, spin out this morality play before a judge, but also to the press. And, and that's what made this case in many ways um, something that, that editors uh, you know, allowed reporters to cover day in, day out. Uh, you know, yes, there was, there, was, there was a degree of fundamental importance to this, um, but it was such a damn good story from the very beginning, from, from the, the, the clips of the videotape depositions of Bill Gates on, that um, no editor in their right mind would have pulled a reporter from that courtroom. And um, it, it just speaks a lot to, to, the, to the way the, both, you know, the government, in this case particularly, put on its case and how it, how it sort of drove that, that narrative through. Um, and, you know, th thinking back to, to you know, these sorts of specific moments, the Alchin video, the, the Gates deposition, and, and of course, uh, you know, the emails. My, uh, my memory is hazy on this particular point, but my, my most memorable moment, particularly in terms of, 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 of David in the courtroom, um, was, was, was a case, and I, I, I can't sort of cite the specific witness, but he, he, the Microsoft witness had said something that seemed to be contrary to something that he had read in an email, and he was just sort of standing back like a, like a leopard waiting to pounce, sort of not even you know in 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 the in the in the chair reserved for the the, the government counsel, and and whispered something to, to to somebody on Phil's team. And you guys went through these boxes every day. You'd come in with these big banker's boxes with documents. He found the email, and you know there it was. And and for those of us, uh, you know, who are not e experts in the law, uh, sitting there in the in the gallery. You know, it was, it was, you know, these were the sorts of moments that kept us sort of coming back and writing about uh, this case. In any event, um, I will stop blathering on and turn mm -hmm. it over to, uh, to Mark. Well, it is really an honor to be sitting here with these guys. I mean, the, there's, there's a special bond that you build, even if you are, you know, sort of working and, you know, arguing back and forth sometimes, and, you know, these guys are some of the most important figures in my professional life, so it's really great to be sitting here. And I, I wanna thank Phil and the Berkman Center for inviting Microsoft to this and allowing us to participate. Um, several speakers have described how they uh, came to the Microsoft case and had their lives changed, so I think I'll offer mine as well. Um, it was August of 1996. I was two months at Microsoft, and I was on my honeymoon and I was in a one-room bed and breakfast on a small island off the coast of Belize. And the woman that ran the bed and breakfast was a uh, uh, die-hard Apple and Netscape fan. And I had made the mistake of offering, you know, when she said, so what do you guys do for a living, you know, blah, 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 you're just newly married, how cute. I had mentioned that I worked for Microsoft. At 7 a.m. the next morning, she pounded on my door to let me know that the government had started issuing CIDs against Microsoft. And, <laughs> and wasn't it great? <laughs> and I looked at my wife and said, this is not a good day for Microsoft. So, um, karma yesterday said that uh, as she looks back, you know, she thinks it's hard to say whether there were actually any winners or losers in, in the Microsoft trial. Uh, I have to say, when it comes to the press coverage, I think it's very clear that there were winners and losers in the Microsoft <laughs> trial. Um, yes. Um, I think that it's fair to say that, that uh, you know, my colleagues and I, that Microsoft was completely unprepared for the scale and the tenor of the uh, coverage that was going to result from the case. And I think that part of it was, as David said, that we were really, we were arguing two different cases in the courtroom. And I think in many ways, we were talking about two different cases with the media. And Microsoft um, was really focused on the technical aspects, the economic arguments. Was there or was there an, or not foreclosure? Did you know, Netscape have mechanisms to deliver its browser to people or not? 
And in a way that quickly became beside the point and I think we didn't realize that quickly enough. Um, it was a little ironic this morning to hear Frank Fisher say that he thought that Microsoft's legal team was playing to the court of public opinion a little too much in its uh, legal strategy um, without giving away any family secrets or airing out uh, family laundry within the Microsoft camp. I can tell you that despite my frequent begging, that was the furthest thing from our lawyer's uh, mind of playing to the court of public opinion. Um, uh, my view is that the, the two sides had, had pretty different philosophies about how legal and uh, communication strategies fit together and that the, the government really saw the, the connection between the legal arguments that they were trying to make and the arguments that would play in the court of opinion, public opinion and that you know, Microsoft really took the position that the audience that we were playing to in the courtroom was an audience of one and that the PR people were free to run around and try to put the best spin that we could put on it, but that, that there was not an integration um, in the same way that there was with the government. I think there's or a the universal, browser. what's that? Or the browser. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a universal truth that whenever two sides are, are in sort of a dispute, uh, that each of them is going to think that the other side is doing more to try to leverage the situation and that each of them is getting a better ride from the media. And I think that probably did, uh, did occur on both sides. Um, it's interesting to talk at this conference with folks who were on the other side and hear, hear from their perspective how they felt things that were going and, and where they felt that we had gotten a, a good ride from the media. I mean, clearly, um, there were some unique factors in this case. Um, the fact that there was no direct testimony at all and that it, it was just cross-examination and then a small amount of redirect really changed you know, how evidence was brought out in the case. And I remember after we broke and we were back in uh, Redmond, it was holiday time and you know, clearly the first two or three months of the case had, had not gone very well and the press coverage had been pretty bad. And one of our executives said, yeah, but we haven't had a chance to get our witnesses on yet and then we're really gonna rock. And we just thought, yeah, it's gonna be nonstop cross-examination <laughs> from David Boyce. That's gonna be great. <laughs> so, um, and another unique factor of, of the case um, was obviously the Gates deposition. And, you know, Karma, uh, it was great to, to hear yesterday Karma say, I can't believe that we got away with playing it day after day after day. Um, you know, there's another interesting factor that, that, you know, when the deposition was being taken, there was actually an order in place from the court saying that no videotape depositions would be played in court. And after the deposition was taken, you know, that order was, was modified and, you know, videotape depositions were allowed to come into the court. And so I think that had a pretty profound effect on trial strategy and, you know, the ability to really move this into a morality play uh, and not just, you know, economic issues and arguments among dry economists. Um, our, our corporate communications tactics uh, changed pretty radically over the course of the six months. I think we arrived, we were gonna be very proactive, we were gonna make sure that you know, we drove the narrative of this case. That was our, you know, Microsoft likes to do version one, version two, version three, that was our version 1.0 strategy, is we were gonna be very proactive. Uh, it quickly morphed into version 1.1, which is we were gonna be very proactive and we were just gonna try, you know, hope like hell that we got at least any message into the coverage. Um, Version 2.0 was we decided we're going to be very reactive. You know, we'd go out and talk on the courthouse steps if David was going to go out and talk on the courthouse steps. And we sort of take our lead from the government. Version 3.0 is we had this blinding realization that the reporters had actually sat in the same courtroom that we had sat in. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't actually need us to go out on the courthouse steps and tell them what they had just seen. Um, and in fact, it kind of irritated them when we tried to tell them what they had just seen. So. You know, it doesn't take very long, but we wised up to it, and so we decided that we would just sort of, you know, head on back to, to our uh, law offices or our hotel rooms or maybe even just get a good run in, and that was probably the most productive thing we could do in working with the media. And if they called us, we'd probably take the call. Um, 
Brad talked a little bit about how you know Microsoft has changed and how the trial changed Microsoft, and Dave talked about how you know the trial uh, changed how we build our products. I, I would also say that the the trial and the experience we went through you know has had a pretty profound effect on how we handle corporate communications at Microsoft as well. Um, before I joined Microsoft, I spent 15 years in government, uh, both in Washington, D.C. and in the uh, you know, communications director for the mayor of Seattle. So I was used to some pretty intense partisan back and forth. I had had protesters chain themselves to my desk in Seattle. Um, <laughs> but nothing prepared me for what I saw when I joined Microsoft, just the amount of adolescent bickering within the software industry. And John, you covered the industry. I mean, every day it seemed like Scott McNeely would wheel out a new, you know, insult uh, for, I mean, he called uh, Gates and Balmer, Balmer and Butthead. He talked about <laughs> Windows as a, as a hairball. You know, it's just the, the level of playground taunting surprised even me coming from government. Um, and I think we, you know, and, and let's just be honest, you know, Microsoft love to give it right back. You know, we're talking about the mid-90s. It was a pretty rough and tumble industry, and we, we loved sort of jabbing each other. And I think we brought a little bit of that uh, to the trial when we first started, that we thought we were still in a fairly aggressive communications mode. And, you know, over time, uh, I think that we really have learned from the case and that the learnings that we had in Washington, D.C. were carried back to Washington, uh, to, to Washington State and the folks who had been on the front lines in the trial were accorded a certain amount of respect and influence in moderating the more aggressive impulses of our communications team in Redmond. And I think we now take a much more long-term approach to our communications. I think we now don't think that you know, our job is to sort of ram our message down the throats of reporters. It's much more to have a conversation that extends over months and over many news cycles and understand where people are coming from and you know understand the dynamics of the industry as a whole and try to have a mature conversation and persuade people to our point of view rather than try to you know bully people to our point of view and the last thing is i think that the the trial has definitely caused Microsoft to have a very thick skin when it comes to, to PR. There are people that join my team from other companies, and they, they're inevitably, I mean, the scene repeats itself with every new person. You know, at some point in the first month, they will show up at my door, you know, breathless, and say, oh my God, you know, look at what's happening here. Look at this, look at this news story. And I'll look at it, and I'll say, yeah, that's, that's not a great story. But you know what? We've seen worse. We're going to make it through this. <laughs> you know, don't get so excited. Um, <laughs> So I think it's good for corporations to have thick skins. I think it's good for corporations to understand how they fit into society and where they stand vis-a-vis -vis the needs of citizens and the role that government plays. And I think that Microsoft, it might have been, there might have been easier ways to learn it, but uh, we learned it. So, so we, um, uh, in the interest of keeping things moving, we're, we're going to probably just only go for another 10 or 15 minutes, but, um, and we'll open it up to questions. But I did want to ask Mark one question first, which is, if you had done a better job with the audience of one, Judge Jackson, in other words, you know, if the judge had been more receptive to your witnesses and, and the arguments in the court, and, and, and ultimately he was the person deciding the case, would the audience of journalists and newspaper stories and magazine articles have mattered. In other words, you know, we were doing it for our readers. I mean, that was our purpose. But, you know, how much did the press actually matter in the context of this trial? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would actually, I'll answer that question and I'll also turn it around a little bit, which is we came to realize that what really mattered in the coverage was how the respective sides did with the audience of one. That, you know, you guys were writing what you saw. And the most important things that you saw was how the judge responded. Right. And so if, right. if Microsoft had, you know, gotten a, a more positive response or a more positive hearing or the body language or the questions posed from the bench had been more uh, positive, I think that the coverage would have been more positive. Uh, the, the other question you ask is, you know, did the coverage matter? Did the coverage in any way affect the outcome? 
I mean, I don't think I'm the best person to ask that of. My, my strong sense is that the coverage probably did not have a significant outcome or impact on the outcome of the case. I think it had a significant outcome or impact on the outcome of you know how people perceive you know what went on in the trial, how pe people perceived uh, Microsoft to some degree, um, and so I think that the coverage was important. But I don't think, in my heart, that it was important to the specific outcome of the case. Yes, sir. A question for Mark, maybe two questions. Uh, a day or two after the European Commission handed down its big decision in its Microsoft case. The Commission or the Court of First Instance? The Commission. Okay. Uh, three United States senators, John Warner was one, uh, gave speeches from the floor condemning the Europeans for meddling in the uh, in affairs that had already been taken care of in the United States. And what's interesting about those speeches is that they were all ver almost identical uh, verbatim. Now, I don't think uh, the three senators got together and said, let's all give the same speech. And in fact, they cleaned up their error later, and only one appeared in the congressional record. I got this from the raw transcript. Now, what was going on there? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, question number two, a broader question. Uh, I don't have the numbers in my head, uh, but when the Microsoft case was escalated in 1998, there was a tremendous increase, uh, several millions of dollars, in Microsoft's Washington lobbying expenditures, and also a large increase in its political contributions. What effect, if any, did you think those contributions had? Boy, this brings you back, doesn't it, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> I may tell my, the story that I left out after all. Um, so let me take the second question first, which is you know, sort of looking at the growth of Microsoft's Washington, D.C. operations and our lobbying. And I'm certainly not the uh, most expert at that. We've got several people here from our law and corporate affairs that I can refer you to as well. But I would take it back even a little bit further than that. Um, in the early 1990s, all the way to like 1993, 1994, we had no one in Washington, D.C. And then in about 1994, 1995, we had a one-person office in Washington, D.C. And the rest of the technology industry was probably in about the same boat, you know, that this is an industry that grew up on the left coast and, you know, basically viewed itself as innovators, you know, working, you know, in a very, you know, entrepreneurial way and that government really didn't have a role in, in the work that was being done. Uh, so the entire industry was rather slow to ramp up, I think, in terms of their Washington, D.C. presence. And over time, I think we came to realize that the issues that we're talking about, technology came to play such a role in the life of individuals, in the life of businesses, and in the life of American society, that government had a legitimate role in, you know, regulating it and looking at it and, and you know, looking at policies that would affect it. And that, you know, the industry had to step up. And so I would not draw a, a line between that and you know, this specific case, I think you need to look at the bigger issues that are going on. Now, for some reason, and I, I'm excited to hear about why, when you asked your first question, Mr. Boyce put his hand up as, as though he wanted to answer it. I'm, I'm, I'm almost afraid of, of what I'm about to hear. I'm not sure what I'm about to hear. It reminds me of my favorite moment of the trial when I can't remember which witness it was who said, I think that's a trick question, and then you said, no, no, I will raise my hand when I'm asking you a trick question. So. <laughs> and then about 10 minutes later, you asked a question with your hand raised. <laughs> so should I be calling on you or should I not? <laughs> One of the things that I thought was interesting in comparison to the IBM uh, case is that after the IBM case was over, the EU went after IBM. And the Justice Department was extremely helpful in helping to keep 
what the EU did in, within some reasonable bounds. And I think for some of the reasons we talked about at lunch, um, the Justice Department and the United States government generally, whether they're senators or, or the executive branch, has been a lot less successful and a lot less able to play a meaningful, meaningful role in influencing what happened in the EU. Um, and it, it, it may be that a new administration will be more effective in that. But I think one of the, one of the consequences of a whole series of, of actions, beginning with maybe the settlement, but including things as disparate as the Iraq war and the effect on, on European countries, um, is that our administration has not had the ability to make the kind of impact that otherwise might have, ha might, might have happened. Um, the, um, I had, had one comment on, what, on Joe's question. Um, lots of judges talk to the press, um, um, and um, including during trials. Uh, they are almost invariably sophisticated enough in doing that to keep the ground rules very clear that it is totally not for attribution at any time, not just until the trial is over. And I think that the, um, the thing, now, now not, not every judge talks to the, to the press, and I think it's a minority, but it's a very substantial minority. And I think the thing that distinguished Judge Jackson was not that he talked to the press, but a certain naivete in, in the sense of not understanding how explosive it was if it was going to get out, and his sort of uh, attitude of, um, uh, well, I don't want you to print it while I'm deciding the case, but once it's over with, you can print it. And I think that was the issue. It was, in my mind, it, it wasn't that unusual for somebody to talk to the press. It was unusual. Well, I'm glad to know that for the Google trial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Judge, uh, Judge Jackson, um, when I spoke to him, made it clear that he was talking to me and evidently to a couple of others uh, only after all the facts were in and the record was closed. Uh, he said that uh, Microsoft has uh, hundreds of people and teams of lawyers and I'm here alone. And um, he wanted, he said he wouldn't be able to, he wanted to be able to explain why he did what he did. Um, and he did ask um, people to, uh, the reporters he spoke to, to keep it off the record. Uh, the fact that he'd done so before deciding the case. Uh, oh, uh, again, after all the facts were, were in, uh, which he thought, he said, it's my job to, to, to have an opinion. And I do have an opinion, and here it is. And uh, the New York Times did not respect that wish when they published their story a day after ours. Um, that's what happened. <laughs> wait. <laughs> wait. Wait a minute. The way it works is you, you're the first person who got Jackson on the record and they did it the next day and then we're the bad guys here? Uh, what happened was the Times story made it clear that uh, the judge had, uh, uh, had talked mm -hmm. you know, prior to the closing of the... Oh, I see. Uh, we only have five more minutes. Um, yes, sir. I'm sorry, this is another question for Mark, but um, I, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about the Freedom to Innovate Network. Um, I, I guess it's the grassroots uh, uh, organization, some might dare to call it AstroTurf, uh, advocacy organization that got set up uh, during, during the trial. I was wondering if you got any mileage of, out of that in terms of, of let's say, Tunney Act comments and uh, you know, wh where, what you see the role for the organization going forward vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, uh, in relation to the, the, the press um, yeah, activities. Sure. Sure. Um, I don't have any insight into whether or not uh, companies that joined the Freedom to Innovate Network uh, helped to provide some of the 32,000 uh, comments that Phil had to read or not. Um, but basically, that is a voluntary organization of people who, you know, sign, of companies that sign up and say, yes, we believe that, you know, allowing high-tech companies to continue to be able to innovate and integrate new features into their products, that's an important consideration for ongoing economic growth. So, Phil, to the extent that they did, you know, uh, make it a more heavy reading cycle, you know, our apologies on their behalf. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, thank you. We're only, uh, gosh. We're back on track. We're only 15 minutes behind schedule. Very well done. Thank you all very much.